And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Civic Literacy and a Civic Lab webinar. My name is Kimberly Brown Harden, and I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be your host and moderator for today. Our presenters for today are Christine Getz and Amy Keister of the Skokie, Illinois Public Library. And I know I probably just massacred your last name. Christine is a collection development librarian for the Youth Services Department at the Skokie Public Library. She is currently at work prepping for an upcoming Civic Lab pop-up focused on endangered species. Amy is the Youth and Family Program Supervisor at Skokie Public Library. Her favorite Civic Lab pop-up topics have been those exploring CRISPR, CRISPR, the Overlooked Accomplishments of Women and Net Neutrality. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. This webinar is part of our online training series. To register for other webinars available for this theme or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov slash library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. The Indiana State Library has many ways we try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. If you have a question, just type it into the chat box on the upper left side of the screen. I will be watching and will get your question to Christine or Amy as soon as there is a good opportunity. There should also be time near the end for questions. This session is one hour, so you will get one LEU for today. At the end of the webinar, please download the LEU. Click on the link, press download, you can then print it out and sign your name. If you notice in the chat box, there is a link to today's survey. Please take a brief survey about this webinar. It helps us to offer more trainings. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of the screen. If there is a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat pod. If you are unable to resolve the sound issues you are re experiencing, we are recording the meeting and you can watch it offline after the meeting has ended. Again, if there is a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Christine and Amy. One, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us today. We'll go ahead and get started so that we can leave plenty of time for questions. Whoops, all right, <laughs> clicked the wrong thing. There we go. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Christine Gertz and I'm one of the collection development librarians for the Youth Services Department. I joined the Civic Lab team in the spring of last year and so far my favorite pop-up has been what is the EPA? And with me is my incredibly talented coworker, Amy Cooster. She is the Youth and Family Program Supervisor. And in addition to being on the board of directors of the Association for Library Service to Children, she also served on the Newberry Committee. Woohoo, Flora, I knew that you <laughs> All right. So we wanted to give you a bit of a heads up of what's going to be on our agenda today, just to give you a sense of where um, there might be some breaks in time for questions. Uh, so we're going to start off, give you a little bit of background on the Civic Lab here at the Skokie Public Library, um, what it is, kind of what our MO is, why we're doing it, and we're going to go into our, some of the logistics, how we actually make it operate. Um, finally, we'll spend a good chunk of time on talking about the three different types of Civic Lab pop-ups that we've really been offering in the last year and a half. We'll conclude with a couple of key lessons learned and then have some formal time for questions at the end. 
That said, if you have a question that arises while we're speaking, go ahead and type that into the chat box because uh, we are monitoring that as we're going. And if it makes sense to just quickly answer a question as we go, we will absolutely do that. Otherwise, feel free to save your questions for the end when there will be some time. So let's really get started. Why a civic lab? So in 2016, which is when we first debuted the civic lab, um, there was something that was going on. You might remember the presidential election and pretty much a lot of the lead up to everything that year was focused around the news, political coverage, and conversation about key issues and topics that were going to play a part in the election. So our community was really giving us a lot of signs that they wanted to know more about what was going on, what they were seeing in the news, issues being debated, but they also wanted to be able to discuss those with um, fellows in their community. So with family members, with friends, and with people who happened to also be in key community spaces like the library. So what we started with is a static space. We had this kind of nook in the library where we created a space that was up for two months and explored six core topics. So those topics were climate change, uh, income inequality, immigration, LGBTQ issues, um, Black Lives Matter, and reproductive justice. So those being six big issues that our community had kind of given us signs that they were really interested in thinking about and engaging with. So all six of those were up for a full two months in a static space. Uh, what that evolved into after the election is a more dynamic civic lab initiative. So what used to be in a set space now pops up throughout the library um, in different areas where there's a lot of foot traffic. You might see a lot of uh, kids, families, teens, uh, adults, seniors, everybody can see us, and we pop up on about two or three topics every month. So instead of having some static topics that are just always there for people to engage with, instead we really focus on uh, tapping into two or three main topics. Um, what we've also done recently is add what we're calling rapid response pop-ups. So I'll get more into the, the differences about these later, but if those two to three uh, topics we think about and plan each month are ones that take a little bit more planning time, that means we're not uh, with those pop-ups quite as easily able to just respond to big topics in the news. So that's how we've recently developed these rapid response pop-ups. Again, happening dynamically in spaces throughout the library, but kind of um, on the spur of the moment as news arises. And like I said, we'll talk more about those later when we get to types of Civic Lab pop-ups. So uh, that's the kind of why of the Civic Lab, how it came to be. Let's talk a little bit more about how it works. So specifically, who is involved? So at this point, when we've been doing the Civic Lab for about a year and a half, we have a team of eight staff members who are really heading up the whole project. So. Um, it began with a team of maybe three or four of us in our learning experiences department here at Skokie. That is kind of analogous to a programming department uh, in a lot of other libraries. Um, if you have the traditional youth and adult teams and that's how your library is divided up into, think about learning experiences as incorporating all of the age groups but really focused on programming, on learning experiences. So it started in one department. But over the last year and a half, that's really expanded to include staff from most of the other departments in the library. Um, like I said, we've got eight core members now of our curatorial team um, that we brought together to kind of make sure that um, we're consistently offering Civic Lab pop-ups, that there's a consistency in how we're offering them, and also that we continue to build on this momentum um, with a lot of staff interest. Okay, so the staff that makes up the Civic Lab, they are staff who have a personal interest in, you know, staying informed, what's going on in the news, exploring current events. And there's three roles um, in the Civic Lab. There's the lead facilitator, and that's the person who decides on the topic, 
they pick the dates and time, they enter the dates and time into our program calendar, and then they reach out to another staff member that either has an interest, um, you know, or, you know, a wide breadth of knowledge about, a about this topic that's been chosen, and that person is the co-facilitator. So then the resource curator is actually the lead and the co-facilitator. So what happens after a topic has been decided and, you know, two staff members have been chosen to lead the civic lab, what they do is they go seek out different sources of information. And we load those sources into our base camp. And usually it's about 15 to 25 different um, sources of material. And then from that 15 to 25, it's whittled down to about five to eight resources for a handout. Now, we mentioned having, you know, leads, co-facilitators, resource curators, um, and that team of eight people. I think what it's also important for us to mention is that it's not just eight people across the library who are involved in a civic lab. Really, anyone who has that interest or personal experience with topics in the news or major issues, um, we actively seek their advice and their input. So even though uh, a staff member who regularly works on the bookmobile isn't going to be here to lead, to facilitate, to put together a handout, we might still have a conversation or send out an email and ask about his experience with a particular topic, knowing that it's something he's interested in and really cares about. So uh, a civic lab, civic engagement, at least in our library, can be a great way for bringing in um, some work uh, peripheral interests from lots of different staff. So one thing that's really important for us to uh, communicate when we are working with different staff is what uh, or why we're really offering civic lab and civic engagement opportunities in the first place. So um, you may have seen a lot of conversation about, you know, our library is neutral. And off, honestly, when we talk about the civic lab with other libraries, that's a big question that pops up. Like, well, how can you do that if the library is neutral? Um, we are coming from a perspective where libraries are nonpartisan, um, but that's not the same thing as being neutral. So, you know, our library has adopted the Library Bill of Rights. We believe in the freedom to read, um, freedom for access to information, and that, that is not a neutral perspective. Um, so what we're really trying to drive home for any staff members who might participate, but also for participants, is that um, the Civic Lab and the library are standing for information and resources, good information, reliable resources, and representative resources as well. So we're not just going to um, kind of go along party lines. We're not trying to get people to agree or change their mind about any sort of topic or issue we're exploring. Rather, what we're trying to do is allow um, patrons and participants to really have a better uh, access to the full breadth of different resources on a given topic so that they can learn something new, consider a new perspective, and at the end of the day, make up their minds about a topic or issue knowing that they've got soluble and solid and credible information. Um, and this is something that has definitely resonated with a number of participants. Um, we had one in a pop-up we did just exploring, uh, you know, what is the Supreme Court and how does it work? And we got to talking about what we were trying to achieve with the Civic Lab. And you can see the quote from this participant who said, you need to have good information in order to make up your own mind. If you have bad information, someone else is making up your mind for you. So we are very, very clearly not trying to make up anybody's mind for them. We're trying to give them all of the resources that they need to be able to make an informed decision for themselves. Um, so I'm seeing some folks in the chat saying, you, you like that nonpartisan versus neutral, that those are very different uh, topics. Um, so yes, if you're coming to this webinar from a perspective of, well, I'm not quite sure that my supervisor or my board or our community would go for this because, you know, it seems like it's a really liberal thing or I live in a, a community that thinks, you know, certain issues are just by and large partisan, really uh, making it clear from the get-go that this is about information and not about reaching a specific decision can be really, really valuable. Okay, so what does each pop-up entail? There are many different components. There's um, the facilitation, which is, you know, the lead facilitator and the co-facilitator interacting with the public. There's a handout of curated resources. 
There's an interactive component, a visual display, the listing in the library calendar, letting people know when we're popping up, and then also documentation after the fact. And this is done in our base camp. So after each pop-up, what we do is we go in, we leave notes, we write about our experience, we maybe um, write what you know our patrons have said and what we've learned. So for those of you who aren't using Basecamp, that is a web-based tool, um, kind of like Google Docs in a way that allows you to create teams and share documents. Um, that way everyone who's involved in the Civic Lab, whether it's those eight core people or folks who are just coming in for one pop-up or another, um, can all access our back notes and all of our resources. Okay, so um, the handout component of our pop-ups, that's just a list of curated resources that we create for each civic lab topic. So it's important that your handout is accessible to a wide age range because your patrons are of a wide age range. And you also want to make sure that you have resources available in different formats. You also want to provide materials from vetted resources so you don't want to have, um, you know, a, an article from Wikipedia on your handout. And you want to include materials with a perspective. But it's really important not to, you know, get hung up on this side versus that side. Um, you know, you don't want a, your entire list to be just two viewpoints. So, for example, when we did our pop-up about endangered species, one of our resources was an article, you know, featuring the viewpoint of a hunter. And we didn't counteract that with, you know, the viewpoint of somebody who works for PETA because there's more than just two perspectives. And we're trying to help participants gain a more critical point of view you know, and there's many, many different points of view. So in doing that, you want to provide information and opportunities to consider those other view viewpoints. Okay, so this is kind of the layout that we use for our handouts. Um, so this is an example from our pop-up of what is the EPA. So we start out with a description of, you know, that topic, and then Below it are conversation questions. We usually have two to three, but depending on space, I think we've mostly been doing two for each handout. You want to make sure your conversations um, are broad and nonpartisan, and you know these questions should be formatted in a way that children can answer them. So you don't want them too intensive. And then we have our list of resources beneath, and that for that you just do like a one to two sentence description. One sentence is better because you're going to be pressed for space. So you give a really short description and then also a link so um, people can access that information. And I should say for those of you who are asking if the slides will be available, um, if you're particularly interested in looking at what the handouts look like, we're going to give you a link at the end of the session um, where you can access all of our past handouts. So don't worry about trying to scribble all of this down now. Okay, and then as you can see, we have many different formats of information, and I think that's really important to provide a different, um, different formats because you want to appeal to a wide array of people and you want to support accessibility. So, you know, you might be interacting with someone who's like, oh, I only listen to audiobooks, or I'm super busy, but I'm really interested in this topic. What do you have for me? And it's like, okay, well, here's a short article on, you know, so, and that's, Kind of something that we try to do too is we usually have a short article and then like a longer article that goes more into depth about our topic but the idea is that you want to have something for everyone who's interested in this topic uh, in your handout okay and then our interactive components so this is just a way to engage patrons while you're in your civic lab and we find that matching games are really popular, not just with children, but with adults also. So an example of that would be when we did um, our pop-up on endangered species, we posted pictures of different animals, and then we had slips of paper that listed different levels of endangerment, you know, vulnerable, critically endangered, and they had to match up the slip of paper, you know, like is the African elephant, is that vulnerable or is that an endangered species? But other ideas that you could do, you could do voting, um, our discussion prompts. We write our discussion questions on dry erase boards, and then we have post-its so participants can leave, you know, their thoughts or answer the question or leave ideas. We also have a small iPad stand, and we usually put one to two very short videos. I don't think any of them are longer than five minutes. So we have that out. And then also our 
pop-ups that are kind of more geared towards pop culture, we do little quizzes to test your knowledge. Well, I see in the chat Becky asking whether other libraries can use our graphics and formatted materials. So what I've been told by our graphic designer is the name Civic Lab, totally up for grabs. Um, but the particular uh, like text treatment, our logo, um, is ours for Skokie. Um, but that said, you'll be able to see all of our handouts from our website, and I definitely encourage you to use the same format if you feel like that's useful to you, same types of content. Um, we'll have our contact information at the end as well, so if you have further questions there, please feel free to reach out to us. So another important part of your civic lab is visual displays. So these really help delineate the space, you know, so it's like it's very clear what's happening here. Um, but it's also a great way and definitely, you know, from a collection standpoint, it's a great way to promote these items in your collection. So even if, you know, only one or two items are checked out for each pop up, it's still a great way to highlight items that maybe get overlooked. So, and it just occurred to me, Christine and I didn't talk about in our planning, like one of the big components of the physical space, which are these um, crates that we use. So I'm going to interject for a minute if Christine doesn't mind. Um, so we purchased 12 of these collapsible crates that, like, truth be told, we never collapsed because it would take too long. Um, and so what that allows us to do is move those easily into anywhere in the library. They're about the size of milk crates. We can stack them to create like a pillar where we can stick up pictures or those whiteboards for uh, discussion. Um, we can also have them uh, kind of around where we're going to be popping up so that it's like a place for people to sit while they're participating. Um, so having that sort of reusable, stackable kind of furniture item has been something that is really useful for us. And it helps patrons to recognize, oh, this is the Civic Lab, because I, I remember seeing these, these pieces. Um, like I said, they're milk crate size. So if you feel like that's something um, that's more feasible for your library, at least to start out before you order anything, maybe talk to your local school cafeteria, see if they have any they can lend to you. Okay, and then we also have our Civic Lab schedule, which is available on our website. So Patrons can see when we're popping up and what time, but another thing that's really nice is if you click on, you know, if you're like, oh, I'm really interested in the Civic Lab on net neutrality, but I'm not able to make it that day. If you click on the link, it takes you to a page where our handout is available in a PDF form. So that's really nice to have those materials accessible. And again, we'll show you that link at the end. So now we wanna spend like the bulk of our time talking about some of the different types of pop-ups that we've offered. Um, and hopefully throughout this process, we'll be able to really illustrate for you um, not only the three different major types of Civic Lab pop-ups we've offered, but also um, some examples of how we've approached different topics. Because it's not really a necessarily a cookie cutter, we approach every topic the same way. Um, so I did just see a question about how long do our Civic Labs last? Great question. Making a note to make sure to preemptively <laughs> offer that next time. Um, so most of them last between one hour and 90 minutes. Uh, some of that has to do with the schedule of the, the lead and the co-facilitator. Um, but what we found since um, these are, in a lot of ways, pop-ups, some people find the listing on the program calendar for the library, but a lot of people just happen upon the, the Civic Labs. Um, we want to be there for at least an hour because that gives someone an opportunity, more people who are just walking through the opportunity to come our way, but then also for someone who thought they were just going to pop in real quick and do something, they can see us, go check out their book, and then circle back. So I found that 90 minutes is really that sweet spot, but you know traffic patterns at your library better. Um, than my guessing for your library. So let's talk about um, two examples from the first major type of Civic Lab pop-up that we offer, which is a basic civics ed education perspective, um, where our goal is to dig into how the government works. So once again, for those of you who are approaching our webinar today thinking, well, I don't know if my supervisor, my board, my community is going to go for this. 
Um, if that's a concern you have, I definitely encourage you to think about how can you kind of like hack the high school civics curriculum? What are some things that you haven't thought about since high school or middle school or college about how the government works that it would be really beneficial for other uh, citizens to be able to understand and get a refresher on? So the first example is how a bill becomes a law. Uh, so the, ultimately the goal of that civic lab pop-up was to give participants of any age an opportunity to learn something new about how uh, legislation works at the federal level in our country. So we just did this uh, nationally. We didn't think about Illinois state uh, legislature, uh, local legislature. We wanted to go uh, large scale because that tends to be the thing a lot of people have learned and have a little bit of familiarity with. So uh, it's our opinion that it's hard to do how a bill becomes a law without reference to the uh, Schoolhouse Rock song, you know, I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill. Yeah, okay, you can finish the rest um, at your desk. <laughs> um, so Christine mentioned that we have this stand where we can display an iPad that we'll sometimes take with us to different pop-ups. And this is one where you know, if you just kind of see a sign that says, talk to us about how a bill becomes a law, maybe not the most <laughs> appealing or inviting thing. However, if you see this cartoon that you remember from school or from when you were little, um, that is kind of a tacit invitation to stop and participate. Um, so there were, was a handout about how bills become laws, uh, a lot of different resources shared that video, and then also the lead and co-facilitator, they had kind of put together this little uh, quiz game, um, which can be a really great strategy for engaging participants and really provides a challenge that's both friendly to any age and any ability level. So they created three quizzes, um, one that was for people who felt like total novices when it came to understanding how bills become laws. So if you didn't know anything before you walked up to the Civic Lab, uh, this was a quiz that tested just the couple of basic things that you would, might have learned there, um, all the way up through kind of the expert level quiz for you know people who went to law school or people who think that you know they watch lots of SVU and so that's kind of the same thing um, to be able to really get some hardcore questions and learn that way. So a friendly game challenge can be a great way to engage people um, and also help them to remember things that they're they're learning through the course of the pop-up. Another example of just kind of a basic civics education one uh, is what is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and there are so many agencies and departments in our government that you could like dine out on these topics for the better part of a year easily just systematically going through and helping people understand, you know, what is this department or this agency that you hear about in the news? Um, you know, when you see the, the abbreviation EPA go through on the bottom news ticker of your uh, CNN or whatever news channel you prefer, um, what does that mean? How does that work? So for the EPA, we really dug into what's the history of the EPA, what were some of the uh, founding uh, motivations for creating the EPA in the 70s, you know, it was a presidential order that created the department. What were they tasked with doing? What is their strategic plan? Like, what are the areas that they're really focused on? Um, so that was a lot of information, like straight from some government websites, some of the historical record. And then uh, this is a great example of when it's uh, great to round out that resource handout with uh, information from your collections um, both nonfiction, which it, I feel like it's a very easy connection for pretty much any civic lab topic to want to include a nonfiction book um, for further exploration, but also fiction, like don't forget fiction in these scenarios. So when we talked about the EPA, two of the resources that we uh, connected participants to were Commonwealth by Jeffrey Sachs, um, who was talking specifically like an environment or an economic perspective of like increasing human population and impact on the planet. Um, 
So note, this isn't like a, necessarily a climate change resource. This is uh, an economic perspective. Um, and then also countered that with a fiction piece by Barbara Kingsolver called Prodigal Summer. I don't know if y'all have ever read that. Um, Barbara Kingsolver went to uh, DePaul University, Greencastle, Indiana. Woo woo, go Tigers. Um, so that's a great um, example of a fiction book that uh, gets at some of the same core topics um, that we were trying to get with our information resources. You know, we're talking about the EPA, so let's read a story that explores some of the like dynamics between um, farmers in rural Appalachia and uh, folks who are concerned about um, like changing migratory patterns for different native species. Um, so it's a way to kind of counter and build on a lot of that factual information that we're helping to convey. So those are two examples of some of those civic-based types of pop-ups. Um, Christine is going to talk about our second major type of civic lab pop-up. Okay, so our second major type um, is issue discussions. And these are ongoing topics of conversation and potential policy. So these are issues that are constantly in the news, if not weekly, like definitely monthly. And I'm going to go over um, two examples, our endangered species pop-up and our genetic editing pop-up. So um, the endangered species conversation, that's an example of an ongoing civic lab pop-up topic because it's always in the news. It's you know, there's always something happening with this issue. And that, and these issues, you know, are regularly discussed. And it's also, this is a subject that many people, they have like some general information about, or they have a strong opinion about, or they definitely, you know, want to broaden their knowledge. But what's interesting about the issue pop-ups is that something always, okay, I shouldn't say always, but something typically happens in the news, like either the week before or like the week of, um, for example, when we did our endangered species pop-up, that week, the current administration had considered lifting the ban on trophy hunting, which was perfect for our pop-up because many patrons, they had really strong opinions about this. So that was kind of really great timing. All right. And then another aspect of our issue pop-ups. Um, so sometimes there's just topics that staff members are really passionate about or interested in, and that can result, you know, in the foundation of a civic lab. Or you can build like an entire civic lab from one great resource. So the genetic editing pop-up that happened, that came, that was inspired by a podcast about CRISPR, which is a genetic editing tool. So from this one really great resource, two staff members were able to build an entire civic lab topic around this. Yeah, and for those of you who are like in the back of your mind thinking like, great, but where do I think about getting some of my own ideas for topics? Um, most of what we've talked about so far in terms of examples of pop-ups um, have included some sort of inspiration or resource from the Radio Lab podcast. I don't know if that's something that you're familiar with, um, but there was a CRISPR podcast from Radio Lab, one specifically about big game hunting. They do a whole bunch of stuff about like Supreme Court cases that have been landmark. Um, so there are a number of us on the curatorial team who are big podcast fans. And just in the course of our everyday listening to those, we'll often kind of stumble upon an idea that uh, ties in really well to what we're trying to accomplish with the Civic Lab. So if you're the sort of person who reads the news, um, watches like news content on TV, listens to podcasts, reads a lot of articles, like those are all great resources because a lot of those um, media are also trying to do the same sorts of things that we are with a civic lab, which is uh, dive deeper into a current topic of conversation. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about our third major type of civic lab pop-up. Um, and this is where we move beyond just kind of the general or the evergreen, always relevant stuff and want to talk more specifically about timely topics in the news. Um, and when we're doing that, our overarching goal is to help put current news in context. So yes, we want folks to be able to understand the variety of perspectives on a news topic that's happening. 
Um, but we also want to give a little bit of context to help them understand it more deeply. Not just what people are thinking now, but how it might relate to how things have happened in the past. Um, so the three things that I'm gonna talk about are a pop-up we did this fall on what is FEMA, as uh, one on executive orders and immigration, and then I'm gonna wrap up this uh, third type example by talking about those rapid response pop-ups that I mentioned. So, if you were following any sort of news coverage at all last fall, you probably noticed we had a lot of really catastrophic hurricanes affecting all parts of the South, the Gulf, the Caribbean, um, a lot of different hurricanes. And when hurricanes are in the news, at least in our country, that also means that FEMA is going to be in the news too. So in a lot of ways, um, our what is FEMA pop-up was kind of a hybrid of that first example of a pop-up where we're just trying to understand better how some aspect of the government works. And this third type, which is responding specifically to topics in the news. So for the what is FEMA pop-up, we really looked at some of the information specific to like the FEMA website, like what are the procedures that people go through when they want to make a claim to FEMA. We also included a lot of different coverage of FEMA responses to past and recent uh, natural disasters. So a big one there, and I think at least for me, the first place that I really heard about FEMA outside of like an old X-Files episode was a Hurricane Katrina. And that uh, there was a lot of coverage of FEMA at that time and a lot of like critical reporting after the fact on how they handled things, whether things could have been handled better. You know, same sort of thing with Hurricane Sandy um, on the Upper East Coast. Uh, several years back. You know, there was a lot of coverage, news coverage, giving different perspectives on what worked and what didn't. Um, so the way that this was really a timely topic is that hurricanes had just happened, FEMA was just starting to go in, and so as we knew that more and more coverage would be uh, shown in newspapers, on TV, on the radio, about what was happening with FEMA for recovery efforts, we really wanted to give people some different resources to be able to reflect back on past recovery efforts with FEMA so that they'd be able to kind of put any sort of current criticism in context. Another great example of putting current news in context is um, one we did about a year ago at this point, a little more than a year ago, so you may remember um, right after the inauguration of our current president, um, there were a number of executive orders issued, including um, three, it ended up being three executive orders that were specifically um, travel bans. Uh, you might have seen news coverage that talked about them as Muslim bans. Again, I'm saying things like the current administration rather than using the name of the president and saying things like travel ban instead of Muslim ban because, again, we want to be about information and so we're trying not to use like the politicized shorthand or things that really automatically inspire a reaction, whether it's positive or negative in participants. So uh, the current president's executive order on travel bans is what we were looking at. Um, so one of the things, one of the ways that we immediately thought you know, we could put this into context. Um, so Skokie, the community where we are, is a community with a lot of immigrants. Uh, it's been wave after wave of immigration since uh, World War II. We actually are one of the largest American resettlements of Eastern European Jews after the Holocaust. And it's just continued since then. Um, our most recent wave of immigrants have been from Pakistan and Iran, the Middle East. Uh, we have got Syrian refugee families. Before that, you know, in the 90s, there were a lot of immigrants from um, East Asia, Southeast Asia. And uh, that specifically was relevant to what we're seeing now with some of these travel ban executive orders. Because we have a number of uh, folks in our community including a number of folks who work in our library who either they personally or their parents or grandparents were incarcerated during World War II because they are of Japanese ancestry. So 
you know, the Japanese incarceration during World War II was the result of an executive order by then President FDR. Um, so what we wanted to do is look at, all right, we've seen these sorts of bans or um, you know, country specific uh, you know, exclusions or uh, incarcerations. We've seen these things happen before. So let's look at how that worked before, what some of the responses were, and then also, like, we had the unique opportunity to have some first-person perspectives um, from a staff member who was, she was small when she was incarcerated, but she was in one of the Japanese incarceration camps. And then another coworker who's on the Civic Lab team um, whose father and grandparents were incarcerated. So they had a lot of first-person stories and uh, artifacts to be able to share. Um, and I think this one in particular was really impactful for our community like it really made sense to them why the civic lab why to offer these sorts of activities um, because you know, we know immigration is a big issue in our community um, there's a big push around the idea of skokie welcomes everyone um, and so to be able to better understand some of the past history with executive orders and immigration really helped people um, to not just respond you know, immediately to someone's Facebook post with like a, I'm totally for this, or I'm totally against this, but to have a little bit more nuance there. So I'm <clears throat> seeing Kathleen say, there's a podcast called Backstory that does much of the same thing. They tend to focus on Virginia history, um, but they might be a useful resource for timely new pop-ups. That's a great example, Kathleen. Like wherever you can find that type of inspiration for um, different issues or stories or ways to approach those issues, we find those to be extremely beneficial. Um, so if anyone else has ideas of potentially great resources, please, please share in the chat. Um, everyone will benefit from that. So the last kind of really news-related pop-up are these rapid response pop-ups. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, and as Christine really uh, articulated in talking about all that goes into a typical pop-up, you know, the handout, being on the formal library program calendar, all of these pieces, what that tends to mean is that it takes, you know, a couple of weeks minimum to plan a pop-up the way we had been doing them for the first little over a year that the Civic Lab existed. Um, and when there's breaking news that happens, you what we ultimately decided is that we wanted to be able to pop up more quickly and not just pop up three weeks after the fact once we you know, created a handout and it went through proofreading. Um, so what we've started doing uh, at the first of this year is offering what we're calling rapid response pop-ups. So the end goal of these pop-ups is, again, to give people a little bit more information, some additional context on something that is currently in the news. So uh, great examples are uh, in January, I popped up a couple of times to talk about uh, immigration legislation. You know, that was um, one of the you know, recent budget fights and talking about uh, DACA and Dreamers. You know, there's, there's a lot of shorthand that gets used in a lot of that news coverage. So what I wanted to do is pop up and be like, what are, what are words that you've heard that you're not quite sure that they mean? Like, People are talking about chain migration. What does that mean? Here's what demographers say it is. Here's how it's used in a political way. Um, so really an opportunity for folks to dive deeper. Um, another example, just last week, my coworker popped up to talk about um, gun violence, specifically gun violence in schools. Um, you know, unfortunately a topic that is continually relevant, but we wanted to really be able to respond to topics we were hearing um, from the community. So at these pop-ups, rather than having a really topic-specific handout, what we've developed is this go-to news sources handout. Um, so you can see a little snippet of it here on this uh, slide. And so uh, this handout can be used at any pop-up, but in particular at the rapid response pop-ups, because what it's doing is giving people some tips and some great first sources to be able to find credible information on developing stories. So it's got a section on, you know, you want to hear more about a local story, start with a local news source. Here are some that are local to the Chicago and Skokie area. 
or you want to learn about business news, here are three objective reporting sites or resources that can give you information there. Same thing for science, health, political, national news. Um, so this is kind of an evergreen handout that we can really use at any point in time to equip people to find good resources on their own. Um, that said, we always bring a laptop down with us to these rapid response pop-ups so that we can help find great uh, resources in real time. So as people ask questions, we're able to look stuff up, use all of those information skills that we've honed over time uh, and training and provide access to some good information. Um, the last thing we're really bringing, and it sounds a little cheesy, I guess, is that a readiness for anything. Like even though when I went to talk about um, immigration uh, legislation as a rapid response pop-up, I was ready to talk about anything that was in the news. And there are people who you know, will come up to us and say, oh, well, this is what you're talking about. I'm not really interested in that, but did you see this? And so what that allows us to do is use our librarian skills that we use at public service desks all the time when you don't know what the patron who comes up to you is going to ask and be able to respond to them in a thoughtful and meaningful way. Um, and seeing the question, have we ever gotten backlash from any of our pop-ups? And I have not. Um, Christina's shaking her head no. No, I haven't either. No. Um, I mean, the only, I wouldn't consider this backlash, but there's been a couple that I participated in. Um, there was one, Whose Land is This Land? And that was our pop-up about indigenous peoples. And we did that um, right before Thanksgiving. And a couple of people were like, oh, I can't talk about this. This is really sad. But as far as like angry backlash, no, that hasn't been my experience at all. Yeah, um, I've not experienced like negative backlash either. We've occasionally had a person or two who will say, oh, well, why is the library doing this? Um, and then you will kind of say, oh, well, we know this is in the news and we want uh, to make sure that people have great information. And then oftentimes someone will respond back is like, oh, are you, what are you trying to get me to agree to? Or what are you trying to get me to think? Um, and that's where it's so important to have all of the staff who are participating in the Civic Lab ready to say, oh, no. Like, the goal isn't for you to decide one way or another. It's for you to feel like you have more information to make up your mind on your own. Like, whatever conclusion you come to, that's up to you. Um, our goal is to make sure that you feel like you have information. Um, so even when people uh, come up to the Civic Lab and approach us with a little bit of skepticism, they end up, um, I think in general, kind mm -hmm. of recognizing, oh yeah, this is just like when I go up to the desk at the library and I ask a question about a book, like they're not just telling me their favorite book, they're telling me some books that tie in with like what my previous knowledge is. And that's the same thing we're sort of trying to do um, with a civic lab, help expand people's uh, level of awareness and reach of information. Okay, so these are lessons that we have learned so far. So the first one is facilitation is important. Um, you can't just rely on your really beautiful visual display for people to come and talk to. Some people will be genuinely curious. They'll be like, oh, what's happening over here? You know, but others, you'll have to pursue them a little bit. And you don't have to do this in an aggressive manner. You're not trying to sell them something. But um, typically what we do is, you know, like what you do at your public service desk, you smile, you make eye contact, and then you say, hey, we're talking about, you know, the EPA today, or, you know, we're talking about genetic editing. So that's a great way to kind of pull people in. And some people, you know, stop and chat for a couple of minutes. Some stop and chat for quite a long time. And others are just kind of like, no, thank you. And sometimes people even, they're like, oh, I'm really interested in this, but I'm in a hurry. I have to be somewhere. And then you can hand them a handout. And that way, that information is still getting out there. So another lesson we've learned is uh, it's really important for us as we're planning um, to resist the urge to overcomplicate things. So I'm sure all of you have experienced this where a patron asks you a question and all they want is like one title, but you end up with a like giving them a full on bibliography of like every possible you know title that could potentially fit the bill of what they're asking for. Um, that's kind of in the nature of a lot of library staff. We, we like to be thorough um, and well representative. Um, 
But when it comes to Civic Lab pop-ups, especially when we're offering two to three different topics a month, it's really important not to, to overcomplicate it, not just from the perspective of we want to make sure we're utilizing staff time effectively, but also so that um, we're not like overwhelming potential participants. So those handouts we offer are always one page front and back. We try really, really hard not to go any longer because we know like something, I don't know, something about people's brains when they see a staple, it's just like, oh no, it's too much information. <laughs> And so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to make sure that it's accessible for all of the people who might participate. And what that means for us is that we're going to pick a topic and we're really going to focus in on it. Um, we're not going to try and get every perspective. We want to get a variety of perspectives and a variety of types of, of resources. Um, but ultimately, this is like a jumping off place. And you know that's one of the great things about having that go-to news sources handout, too. You can give that person who says they're busy, they're interested in the EPA, you can give them the what is the EPA handout, you can give them the go-to resources handout so they can start with a little bit of guided, curated resources and then go off on their own and still feel confident in what they're exploring. Um, Kathleen mentioned that one of her library school professors used to call that uh, dead mousing after cats bring dead mice to their uh, owners. Yeah, you're bringing too much, like it doesn't matter anymore. They got what they needed. <laughs> Great example. Um, so the last uh, lesson learned is that flexibility, we've learned, really is key. Um, and I want to emphasize that you're prepared to be flexible already. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but when you're working a public service desk and someone's approaching the desk, you have no idea what they're going to ask. Um, but you're ready to respond to whatever their, their question is, their needs are. Um, and that's the same sort of flexibility that we found is integral in offering Civic Lab pop-ups. You know, as we've kind of brought in new staff over time, there can sometimes be a little bit of hesitation or anxiety at first, that like, oh, well, how can I pop up around this topic? I'm not an expert in it. Nobody needs to be an expert um, in the topic because we're experts in how to find information. Um, and so remembering that this is already part of your library service skill set um, can be really uh, empowering as you embark upon uh, creating ways to have these sorts of conversations with uh, your patron. So we're at the end of our uh, slides. We've got our remaining time to talk about what your questions are. So as you're typing in your questions in the chat box, I do want to show you really quickly um, what that handout resource looks like. So this is the link up here, skokielibrary.info slash resources slash civic dash lab. And that'll take you to a spot that shows you all of our upcoming events. And if you click on one of them, it's going to tell you the handout. So you can click on a handout. And there you go. You've got the whole thing. Um, similarly, if you're looking at our past events, you can click on all of those, and anything that did have a handout is going to be linked there. So, all right, let's look at your questions. How long does it take to plan a basic pop-up? Christine, you want to feel that one? Sure. Um, typically, they take, I want to say, about two weeks. The most time-intensive part is your handout because you're gathering resources, and then, you know, you obviously you read or listen to all of them and discuss them with your co-facilitator. And then from those resources, you choose five to eight. So that, and then you have to, you know, plug in your components into the layout of the handout. So I think that's the most time intensive part. And then what we do at our library is we send it off um, to our advertising, no, not advertising. You know, we've got a, a couple of staff who are part mm -hmm. of our proofreading yeah. queue. So all of our handouts have to go through proofreading, which takes about a week. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, I think, I don't think I've ever had, it's ever taken me over two weeks to plan one. It's mostly gathering resources. That's the part that takes the most time. Um, so another question, how do you evaluate if it's effective or learning outcomes? So at this point, we haven't actually tried to measure outcomes of Civic Lab pop-ups. Um, we're more looking to kind of gauge success in terms of 
Uh, did people stop and participate? Um, what types of conversations did we have? Um, we're specifically looking to see, like, are people willing to talk about perspectives other than their own to learn something new? Um, so it's not like hard and fast measurement at this point, no super solid data points. Um, but uh, it's something that we're thinking about, um, you know, kind of broadly, one of the things that we've done is look at uh, voter turnout in elections over the past 10 years. And um, we're interested to see if the needle has moved at all in terms of participation next month in the Illinois um, primary election. November, we have a, a gubernatorial election. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the indicator metrics we're gonna look at, but I don't know um, whether the civic lab itself is gonna have had a huge effect or how we'd be able to tell that. But really we're looking like, are people willing to read a new resource, have a conversation, consider something they hadn't previously? Um, so another question, do you show people ways that they can act on what they've learned about an issue by influencing public policy or legislation? Um, so yes and no. So on the one hand, and on a lot of our like issue topics, things like endangered species, um, we don't typically include on our handouts like, what do you think? Like tell your elected official. Um, because a lot of times those like pathways or petitions are really politicized. Um, that said, if someone asks us, uh, you know, oh, I'm, I'm interested in this and want to connect with somebody, like we'll basically treat that as a reference interview and figure out how they can do that. Um, that said, we have had a number of pop-ups and we like to do these um, on election day. We did it on inauguration day. Um, where it's just, how do you contact your elected official? So we usually call it Dear Elected Official. The handout has how you can find and reach out to your local legislators, county, state, federal. Um, and so that's something that people find really appealing. Um, don't forget to fill out your survey for today's webinar. <laughs> uh, another question that we brought up some pop-ups planned around controversial topics. And we mentioned using non-politicized words and focusing on resources and information um, to steer clear of partisanship. But do you have mm -hmm. any other tips? That's a great one. Um, one of the things that we're asking our staff member who does training for the library to, to look for is a kind of a refresher training on how do you redirect unproductive conversations. So our staff members, who are leading pop-ups, I feel like are really uh, well-versed at not going into like their personal opinion territory or like using hyper-partisan language. But that doesn't mean that someone who comes to a pop-up isn't going to go into that territory. And so we're looking for ways to kind of have that refresher. The same thing you have like when someone comes up to the, the reference desk and instead of asking a library question, wants to ask you about your personal life, like how do you redirect that in a way that is non-confrontational but clearly redirects. Um, so that's a resource we're looking to develop um, so that we just have that reminder of how to move those conversations back to an information-based uh, conversation. So if you have any ideas for resources there, we'd love to hear them. Uh, topic idea, what are the effects of a government shutdown a good one. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> <Very> good one. <laughs> um, then we say that we have topics in language for a wide array of ages. Do we ever do just a specific, very kid-friendly handout? That's a great question and also a great suggestion. We haven't done a specific, like, separate handout for kids. When we first started the Civic Lab, um, and the reason I'm talking so much is because I've been doing this from day <laughs> one, and Christine joined us, like, about a year ago. Um, so when we first started the Civic Lab on those six main topics, Black Lives Matter, climate change, et cetera, um, we had a special portion of our handouts that was specifically like books to share with kids to explore these topics. Um, you, we mentioned we still like to have a kids or family conversation starter question. Um, so for us, we haven't done specific kid handouts because we haven't yet done specific kid Civic Labs. Um, all of our civic labs have really been all ages, and we stage them in like main thoroughfares of the library so that anybody can participate. But certainly, if we were going to look at um, offering 
a topic specifically for kids, absolutely, we would curate just for kids. And Christine would be a big part of that because right. she, she buys kids' materials for the library. Right, and I think our displays, too, are, you know, much more kid-friendly than maybe our handout. But what's interesting is, Amy, didn't a local school kind of tailor, like, our, you know, the idea of the Civic Lab to something that was more school-appropriate? Yeah, so um, one of our local middle schools actually recently um, asked, they reached out and said, could they use some of the Civic Lab stuff? Could we give them a, a mock-up of the handout? Um, and they're doing it now in their school library. So they'll pose a question. Um, kids can respond on post-it notes. And then I haven't seen the handouts yet, but my understanding is that the, the librarian is using specifically resources that kids can find using technology at their school. So great ideas. Good reminder, Christine. We've only got like one minute left. <laughs> Any lingering questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can see our email addresses on the screen. Don't forget to fill out the survey for today's webinar, and don't forget to download your uh, LEU. I know those are important in Indiana, in Indiana, so, yep. All right. Thank you all so much for having us. All right, yes, thank you.